a few more people filtering through to give them a chance to grab a cup of tea after a morning of workshops. Um, but thank you everyone who's joining us here. Uh, my name is Claire and I'm joined by Fleur. I'm marketing manager at Love to Ride and Fleur is our insights and behavior change manager. Um, so today we're going to be speaking to you a bit about behavior change, going to give you a brief overview and then kind of take a bit of a dive into how those things, those particular theories can be put into action to achieve change. Um, for those of you who don't already know Love to Ride, we're predominantly an online cycling encouragement platform. Um, we have behavior change baked into every step of the process. And we have one ultimate aim, which is to get more people riding bikes and to be riding those bikes comfortably and confidently, whether that's for leisure, transportation, commuting. Um, we're here to help make that happen. And um, the way we do that is kind of outlined on this slide here. Um, so at first, we really want to understand an individual and uh, what, they, what their relationship is to riding a bike, what their perceived barriers are, and also what's getting them excited about the potential of riding a bike. Um, and we do that via surveys when they sign up to the platform. Once we've collected that really rich information at a personal level, we then use that um, to engage them in different programs and campaigns. Um, we have quite like fun, playful branding. And we also have a lot of uh, features which kind of use gamification to kind of get a rider looking at us and interacting with us. We then also encourage them. So they get really targeted messaging that speaks to the information that they've given us in those surveys. Um, so they get the information that they really want. They also get a lot of peer-to-peer -peer interaction. We have high fives, stories, um, and photos on our platform, which encourages people to get chatting to each other. And we also have badges. Um, who doesn't like earning a badge? That kind of incentivization and a sense of fun. Um, also, as part of that process, we educate a rider. It's really important for building their confidence and making them feel ready to get out there and start using the roads or using their bike for different forms of transport. So at a local level, we supply information about local cycling communities, training that's available. Um, we also offer training via our web app in terms of tips, articles and quick courses. And then they also have targeted email communications and announcements to make sure that information is getting in front of them at the right time. And then we track all of that. So we know how a rider's feeling, how they're moving along in their journey of riding a bike. Um, we have integrations with Strava as well to make sure we're collecting even more data. And then we learn from all of that to then start the cycle all over again and keep on finessing and tailoring our approach for maximum impact. Um, so that's kind of how Love to Ride works in a quick and wordy nutshell. <laughs> I'm now going to pass you over to Fleur, who's uh, going to get you guys skilled up on behavior change and how we use it. Cool. So um, we're going to be looking at a behavior change model um, called the FOGS behavior model. Um, and looking at applying a relevant uh, theory that works really well with this model um, to encourage people to do a certain behaviour. So talking about behaviour change because it provides, um, it can help to provide really good value for your programmes. Um, if you ground your encouragement within behaviour change, then it helps you to understand the different uh, drivers and barriers that sort of influence uh, decision making. So in uh, BJ Fogg's behaviour model, um, he suggests that behaviour um, is a, uh, a combination of um, someone's ability alongside uh, their motivation and that the action is completed, the behaviour is completed when a prompt um, aligns with their ability and their motivation. Um, so the Fogg's behaviour model alongside uh, tiny habits theory are uh, the two tools that we've applied at Love to Ride that I'll be going through this workshop with you to uh, help you sort of understand how you might be able to apply this tool. 
Um, so in terms of ability, um, this can be understood as uh, someone's physical or mental effort towards doing a behavior, um, whether they have particular skills or available time or money. So if something is perceived as easy to do, um, it would exist on this end of the scale um, and wouldn't require high levels of motivation for that behavior to be complete. So most of our sort of regular habits are things that we do without um, thinking about. They're fairly easy for us to complete, don't require high amounts of motivation, and so that, that behavior is achieved. Um, if you can think of ability in terms of time, people might um, perceive a certain behavior such as cycling as taking up huge amounts of time. That's a high amount of ability that they would need um to be able to do that behavior if they were short on time so they'd perceive that action as something that's hard to do so they'd exist in this end of the scale so you can see that you'd need high amounts of motivation to encourage someone who would perceive cycling is something that is time consuming and that they don't perceive that they've got enough time to spend doing that behavior um, you'd have to motivate them to do it a lot harder than encouraging them to do an easier behavior. Um, so motivators can be uh, grouped into three categories, um, sensations, anticipation, and belonging. Um, all of these have positive and negative associations with it, um, which we'll come on to a little bit later. But in general, a person must feel enjoyment towards um, doing behavior, they get enjoyment from doing the behavior, um, feel hopefulness towards completing the behavior in the future and often some people are motivated by uh, feeling socially accepted um, by actioning a behavior. So tiny habits is a way of digesting all of that information um, and applying this theory um, for encouragement. So the tiny habits sort of theory or the idea is if you start somebody off doing an easier behavior um, which requires low amounts of motivation, then they would be able to action that, they'll be able to get some of those motivators such as enjoyment, um, they will be feeling hopefulness for completing the, that behaviour again in the future, and then gradually you can prompt them and nudge them along this ability and motivation scale to do harder and harder behaviours as their motivation to perceiving future behaviours increases. Um, we'll be breaking that down further um, as we go through this presentation. So at Love to Ride, we segment our audience based on riding frequency. Um, so riding frequency could be understood as that individual's riding ability. Um, and we do this to make our encouragement more effective. So we speak very differently to our new riders, understanding that they may perceive cycling as something that requires high amounts of ability um, and something that they may not feel like they've got appropriate skills or they're not positively motivated to cycle. Um, in contrast, regular riders are already riding. They're already experiencing all of those motivations, sense of enjoyment. They know they can ride, they're gonna ride in the future. Um, but for these people, it's about trying to encourage them to ride further or perhaps for um, different trip purposes. So riding for transportation or riding to work will be the next incremental tiny habit that we can put in that regular rider's journey. Um, so these two emails are taken from our Rider Out campaign, uh, which we ran in March. And they're just two really good examples of how we speak to those audiences differently and the value of understanding our audiences when we're trying to encourage them to do something. So for new riders, um, if you look down here, this is our ability. Um, we understand that there might be something standing between a new rider taking that first step to uh, enjoying a bike ride. So we're providing them with the tips and tools uh, to facilitate that. Um, whereas our regular rider, this person has already logged 18 trips. Uh, so we know they're already, they've got that ability, they're, they probably are higher, um, 
probably more motivated to do harder behaviors. Um, and we're celebrating that. We're reminding them that they've already achieved this great thing. Um, let's see if we can encourage them to ride further next time. Whereas the new rider, we're just very much saying like, read these tips and then see if you can enjoy a bike ride of 10 minutes. Um, for uh, new riders, for new riders and regular riders, we're highlighting um, motivations, which tap into um, the benefits that they would see receive from cycling. So that hopefulness towards the behavior. Um, and in both, we're signaling a very clear prompt of what we're asking them to do. Um, so to enjoy a bike ride, to ride further, and to log it on our platform. So Claire, do you want to talk through the first task that hopefully we'll get our workshop audience doing? Yeah, so we're hoping um, to kind of send you all away with uh, an audience to work with and how you're going to get them excited about riding a bike. And this kind of feeds into a question that Chris has asked as well. Um, so hopefully we can work through getting that answer for you with this exercise. Um, so I want everyone to like note it down quickly, but like have a think about a specific audience you want to work with. Um, so there's just some great questions here that Fleur's come up with to help you think about that. But like, do they already cycle? That's something really important to consider because maybe it's people who do, but you want to get them riding more. Um, so they're already riding for fun but you need to get them riding to commute to work or for transportation? Um, or are they just keen but don't know where to start? Um, and maybe they don't even consider cycling as an option and there's an education piece to do there. But if we just have a quick think about an audience you want to engage with um, and how, and then, yeah, we'll work through what their barriers, motivations and opportunities are um, applying behavior change theory. Just give you a couple of seconds to do that, to jot something down or maybe put it in the, the comments section. Yeah, I think especially um, with the group that like Chris is talking about, if you're thinking about early adopters, maybe you want to consider for consider people who it's easiest for. So that do they live in a 10 minute catchment area around the hospital? They're probably your low hanging fruit. People who are already part of a cycling group but not commuting. It's kind of like thinking about those people who've already got behaviors or their journey is really small and those might be the people that you reach out to first yeah the idea of this exercise and the sort of working through this model is to sort of demonstrate how important audience research is or um understanding the audience that you want to target the specific audience that you want to work with because they'll have different levels of ability and They'll, they'll exist on that scale somewhere. So it's about prompting them at the right point. Um, so I will continue working through this. Great. So like I've just said, understanding your audience is really important. Um, if you're going to apply that baby steps uh, or tiny habits uh, theory, you need to be really clear about who you want to engage with. So um, understanding your audience will um, help you to understand their current levels of ability. Um, and at it, each stage of someone's riding journey, there will be associated barriers and different motivators that you can tap into um, so that your prompts are most effective. Um, and not only do these barriers um, exist uh, from a new rider who's wanting to ride more often or just begin riding to a, a regular rider who's wanting to ride to work those barriers are going to be very different but also the barriers within different demographics are going to be um very different um i don't know if any of you went to uh lucy and adrian's workshop on inclusivity but it's about understanding how um barriers present themselves very differently depending on different demographic groups um, that which could be influenced by sort of individual social or cultural um, influences. Um, so our own research shows that there, there are barriers that um, are more prevalent um, 
based on different demographics and that these change um, as riding frequency increases. Um, so this is an example of, of how it's important to know what those barriers are within your groups. Um, so our new and occasional riders, uh, which are this, up in this graph up here, um, they're people who are riding less than one day a week. Um, and as you can see, there's like quite clear differences between um, the barriers that women more commonly are citing um, compared to men. So our female riders are, is this uh, orange bar here? Um, but as you see, is riding frequency increases. Um, so our more regular riders who are riding one day a week or more, the differences between barriers um, sort of evens out, the differences between genders and, and the barriers evens out slightly. There's, there's still some differences there, but they're, they're nowhere near as sort of stark as in our newer rider um, category. So uh, if we take a look closer, um, this uh, sort of chart uh, represents that uh, women are um, three times more likely to cite that they don't feel confident um, to ride more often or to begin riding, and 11% 11, 11 um, more likely to cite that they don't know a safe route or they don't have enough knowledge about uh, where to ride. Um, so there may be common barriers that exist, um, sort of like your bikes at the back of the shed. That may not be a barrier that is felt um, more prevalently amongst certain demographics, um, but there will be some barriers that will feel more limiting to um, certain demographic groups. And if we, we find this, if we find that out early on within designing your programs, then it allows us to um, sort of put our resources and time into that design and spend those resources more efficiently. Um, so if we link this back to the BJ Fogg model, um, our data would suggest that for this 43% of female registrants, um, they view cycling as a behavior that is hard to do. So they're on that hard to do end of the ability scale. Um, if we're going to encourage them to ride, whilst they have those perceptions of that behavior, then those individuals would need to be very highly motivated, which is just not reasonable when you, you lack confidence towards doing something. Um, so if you were looking to encourage that group of uh, women to ride, um, then you might want to start with something that's about increasing their confidence. So adult cycle training or group rides or, um, try bike events, um, these will help those women um, start to perceive that they have more ability and they find that that um, uh, behavior easier to do. Um, and then their motivation can start to increase as they perceive the behavior is something that's easier and easier to do. And then eventually, hopefully they'll be on something a lot harder like cycling further or cycling to work but it's very important to start them at the most easiest step for that group of people those group of people um, so in order to understand your audience um, which is really important for this model you can do this in a number of ways as uh, so primary research is one of them um, through surveys, focus groups, um, primary research is sort of the creme de la creme of uh, finding out about your audiences because there could be local barriers that um, you are more easily picked up through that uh, primary research method. Um, it also allows you to get the most current up-to-date data, um, but this is very time consuming um, and understandably time is a big, um, barrier uh, for many local authorities and businesses. Um, so secondary data um, can provide a useful first step, um, particularly if you're looking to work with a very specific audience. There's often um, academic research papers that have done um, similar studies, um, have tested out similar programs and seen how, that, how those uh, results um, affect different demographics. Um, 
but this is just to show that like the there are many differences that exist um not only within rider groups within demographics but also across the uk so that that local knowledge is really important to the specific audience that you're working with um, so these are a few barriers that we've gathered through our own data um, just to get you sort of thinking about common barriers that might exist to your audience um, and how sometimes these are very similar to elsewhere in the UK um, or further afield, uh, but also how sometimes these are, these are quite different. Um, so if you look at Derby, uh, for example, bike maintenance workshops may be something that is more useful for these new riders um, in Derby as that's a more common barrier than say, um, a lack of confidence. Um, whereas in Bristol and Manchester, um, lack of confidence is the, the main barrier that new riders are citing there. So time would be well spent uh, improving confidence for new riders. Um, and sort of the same, you can see that in the majority of regions that not knowing a safe route is um, also a very common barrier for the majority of reg regions in this um, this data, except for Brighton, um, who are sort of down here. So maybe Brighton have done something to improve um, sort of new riders' uh, routing. They maybe there's more signposting for for local riders there, um, but you can see that that there are differences that that exist. Um, so, Claire, do you want to go through the second task? Yeah, so um, Lauren just has like a look at your sheet or document or whatever you did the first task in. Um, we're just going to have a look or just have a think about what like barriers could be um, and have a think about where you are as well. Because we've seen like, uh, I suppose if you compare like Brighton compared to other places, I think um, don't know a safe route was really low. So you'd think that maybe infrastructure wouldn't be primary concern for them, but maybe um, workshops to fix a bike was more important. So if you look at our examples, um, we've got uh, two women groups, one who currently ride, don't ride, sorry, but are interested in starting. Uh, and I think a really important barrier to remember here is not even owning a bike. Um, it's one that often gets overlooked, but just access to a bike, whether it's a loan scheme or local hire service, super important and great for getting those people who currently don't ride onto a bike. Um, and then we've got women who ride a little bit, but not yet for transportation. So if they're not riding for transportation, is that because they need more confidence to ride on the road in traffic? Do they not have the time? Maybe they've got childcare and other time-based responsibilities. Um, so yeah, I just wanna have a think about the audience that you've identified and then what the current barriers to them starting to ride a bike would be. And we've got some great comments going on as well. And I'll keep on replying in there when I can. Um, but yeah, thanks for sharing that stat, Zeev. 30% of women report not owning a bike as their main barrier. So, you know, it's really important to direct people to that information at a local level, for sure. Mm -hmm. Right, should we move on with the presentation? Yeah. So alongside um, a person's ability, so that bottom end of the BJ Fogg's uh, behavior model, um, alongside the top, you've got motivations. So um, BJ Fogg uh, groups motivations into three categories, uh, sensation, anticipation, and belonging. And these all have positive and negative um, associations with them. So um, in general, for somebody to be motivated for a behavior, um, they must find it enjoyable, be hopeful for a positive outcome, and uh, see it as something that may increase their social acceptance if they're influenced in that way, if they're motivated in that way. Um, so it's important to understand where your audience lies in um, what personally motivates them so that you can tap into those specific motivations. 
Um, in terms of cycling, um, the best motivator really is providing opportunity for experience. Um, so facilitating someone to ride a bike for just 10 minutes is what we talk about at Love to Ride. Um, this is really, really valuable as it taps into multiple motivational points. So people feel enjoyment from it. They've experienced it, so they're, they're hopeful that they can experience that again. Um, and depending on the context, they might feel you know, socially accepted amongst their peers. Um, I actually saw this behavior change happen in person. Talk a lot about, I look at a lot of numbers, a lot of data, a lot of theories. Um, but I was, uh, a few years ago, I was in Bristol, I live in Bristol. We had uh, yo bikes. And my friend who hadn't ridden a bike for years since childhood, she got on a yo bike and within seconds she was talking about how it brought her freedom, how she um, felt like a child, how she was really enjoying it. Um, and then a few weeks later, bought a secondhand bike and then eventually started commu commuting to work. Um, so those tiny little steps that tap into those little motivations um, can make a big difference in the long run. Um, so again, audience research is uh, really important here as um, audience groups may be motivated in different ways. Um, there's research that we've, we've discovered recently that uh, suggests that physical activity, engagement in physical activity, um, the reasons uh, for engaging in physical activity can uh, vary uh, based on gender. So women, it, the research found that women were more motivated by um, the social side of physical activity, so such as cycling, um, and the sense of building a commu community, so receiving support from peers and like certain peers in their, in their social groups. So now if you want to go into motivations, um, Claire, do you want to yeah, talk about Yeah, so this? I think, you know, being the marketing manager, getting to talk about like, the happy inspirational stuff is like my favorite bit and it's why we all love riding our bikes right um so yeah now we're gonna take a look at those audiences we've got their barriers so we know what's holding them back but what are you going to motivate them with like what's going to get them excited and smiling when they think about riding a bike and ultimately get them on one um and yeah we've spoken about this before in other workshops and we've got a really great um webinar on our blog as well called Supporting More Women to Ride. Fleur got some great stats for that. Um, but we know that like that social aspect is really important for women who are new riders. So maybe it's riding with their friends, um, getting to enjoy the outdoors more, improving your fitness. Like those are things that everyone wants, but we know that the social aspect is incredibly important for women when it comes to riding a bike. Um, and then for the women who are riding a little, but not yet for transportation, sustainability is a huge motivator for a lot of people now. And, you know, we all know that's on the up this year as well. Um, and also spending time outdoors when we're talking about commuting as well. Also, we might just be saving them time in general. If you think about that time spent in stationary traffic on public transport or in a car, even if you're moving at like a slow pace, as long as you're constantly moving, you might be getting that time back if it's a short commute as well. Um, and then, yeah, the opportunities. So these are the things that you're going to give people to help make that thing happen. Um, and group rides are fantastic. Like you get that social aspect, you get the comfort of knowing that you're gonna be in a space where you're slightly more protected, like-minded people, and you're gonna get that kind of social aspect of it. Adult cycle training, we love bikeability, couldn't be happier about it. Everyone should have it everywhere all the time. But you know, adult cycle training, really important for building confidence. And then building it into people's day as well. Can you organize lunchtime rides? Can maybe a bike breakfast for your commuters? You've got that um, kind of like treat incentive aspect, but still the social. And um, in the transportation column, we can see inviting people to swap just one short car journey. And there's that baby steps. It's not an all or nothing. It's not Monday to Friday, you're cycling all the time. So like, can you do it on a Wednesday, twice a month? 
like that's a really great message really accessible and makes it seem like you can make that happen without too much of a time commitment and too much of a shift of your routine that you've already got and then you can start to gradually build it um so yeah just have a think about those things for your audiences as well and you've already started to build up like a really great plan using some behavior change theory to engage those people and get them riding bikes Cool. And then we're going to take a look at an example of um, that tiny habits, baby steps um, theory in practice. So this was a, a lovely story that I've come across on um, our stories feature of our platform. Um, and it just really beautifully demonstrates um, how tiny habits can lead to big, uh, big changes. So this person begins to say that they started cycling in uh, lockdown. Um, they did it to ease the stresses of lockdown. So that feeling of anticipation and hopefulness towards cycling as a behavior, that's a key motivation. Um, they started off cycling six miles every morning, which I think is probably not everybody's first step when they uh, begin riding, but it's a brilliant first step for this person. Um, and pretty quickly they realized that um, they got to a point where less than 15 miles seemed like a quickie. So that's ability, their ability has increased, they're getting that motivation, they're doing a slightly harder behavior. Um, over the year, they uh, got great pleasure from their morning rides, so that personal reward, that personal motivation of enjoyment, um, and new habits started to develop um, they then went on to do a 20, 20 to 25 daily, uh, daily ride um, and they finally were able to do a 46 mile ride um, with encouragement from their friend. So that demonstrates again their ability increasing, um, perhaps motivation, mo being motivated by um, that social acceptance, being able to do it with a friend um, and getting all of the benefits that come with cycling, um, which would probably be really uh, personally motivating for this person. So increased ability, increased motivation. They've gone from a six mile ride to begin with to then uh, completing a 46 mile ride. Um, so it really beautifully demonstrates how those baby steps can lead to a much harder behavior. Um, so we've only very quickly gone through um, one behavior theory or model. Um, there's many, many others out there, um, which all fundamentally at, have at the core um, the importance of understanding your audience and being really specific when you're talking to a group of people and trying to encourage them to start riding or to ride more often. Um, we've applied many theories and models. Um, over the time I'd love to ride uh, to try and encourage people to to ride more regularly um, so we use tools such as goal setting or social norming working with workplaces um, providing tips and quick courses um, and now uh, as we continue to grow so we've got over 170,000 people uh, registered in the UK um, we'll be looking at the tools that we've baked into our platform and seeing how different demographics um, interact with those different tools. So can we see whether um, sort of younger groups of riders are more influenced by um, people's individual motivations and the individual leaderboards, or are women more interested in setting goals? Um, to see if, if we can find out that information, then perhaps we can start targeting that information um, to an even more specific audience um, to hopefully encourage them to ride more often. So uh, the last task we're going to ask you to do is sort of a, a takeaway task. Um, Claire, if you want to run through that. Um, yeah, so this is just the final bit, really. Um, now you kind of know who your audience are, what their barriers are, what their motivations are, and, you know, different opportunities you can offer them to make behavior change happen. Um, this is just a chance to think about how you're gonna communicate that. So what language are you gonna use? Um, 
to get people excited about it and um, to help support their motivations, really. Um, so opportunities, you may have listed a few. I think it's probably good just to pick one and then just kind of almost think of this as a like a tagline and brief description. Um, so, you know, what's that headline going to be and really communicate what that opportunity is to them and uh, speak to their motivations. But I suppose at the same time, we just need to be mindful of those barriers. So you don't wanna um, kind of increase that uncertainty or signpost the things that are holding them back. It's more about speaking to those motivations, communicating that opportunity. And then I think, think of the barriers when you're crafting that opportunity and making sure that those things aren't present or you're helping to build their confidence to overcome them. Really great comments going on in the chat as well. Some really important conversations about, uh, yeah, different barriers and uh, a lot of chat actually about um, kind of changing what the perception um, of a cyclist is. And I think that's really important. And a huge part of this is a uh, kind of when we talk about a cyclist, we use that as language to encompass everyone but actually it conjures an image normally of a slim man in lycra whizzing really fast and um yeah i think everything that's been mentioned in the chat and kind of kind of moving that picture to one side and replacing it with really diverse images in people's minds is super important um mm -hmm. so there's definitely a barrier and an opportunity uh, to be thinking about in terms of just like wider cycling definitely and that like perfectly aligns with that motivation of sort of social acceptance it doesn't necessarily have to be i feel socially accepted amongst my peers but i feel accepted into this community um i see myself as one of these people that i see riding bikes so i can do that it's going to increase my confidence to to make it feel like that's something that that i can achieve that i have the ability to do it Great. So hopefully everyone's got a form filled out um, with some ideas and things to move forward on. Uh, it's worth noting that our colleague Sam, he's in our booth all day and uh, very skilled and tooled up on all of this stuff, way more than me. Uh, Fleur and Sam have been at Love to Ride for many years, um, great brains to pick. You've got our contact details on this slide here. Um, but yeah, just wanted to say thank you so much to everyone for coming um, and for hearing this session. We've got a couple of questions if we've got time to answer them quickly, Fleur. Yeah, let's go um, for it. So just one quick one from Emily, who joined late, was asking, um, amongst my female friends, there's a desire to cycle, but concerns over safety, especially on dark winter days. How can we address this? Sorry, could, I was just closing down my screen share. Could you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> so um, amongst my female friends, there's a desire to cycle, but concerns over safety, especially on dark winter days. How can we address this? Well, again, it's sort of giving um, your friends, that community, the, the tools to be able to cycle in the winter. Um, so educating, uh, educating your friends about um, winter riding and the importance of being seen um that will help when i feel visible i feel confident to ride in dark in the darkness um so it's about giving people the appropriate tools to overcome the barriers um that they face yeah and then um there's been a bit of a chat in the comments as well about um strava and that being for um kind of a view of male commuter cyclists um, and is it fitness related? And I suppose um, with Strava Metro, there's a lot of data to be gathered there, but maybe you could speak a bit about love to ride data and um, like kind of the variety and stretch you can get out of that. Yeah, I mean, um, I never use Strava. I don't know whether Claire, you use Strava, you're, you're a more regular, regular rider than I am. Um, but there's, there's definitely, um, sort of there is we do tailor to the sports cyclists 
Um, but on Love to Ride, you're sort of encouraged to log any kind of trips um, and you've got the metrics um, to sort of support and engage you to do that. So you're able to see sort of how many trips you've logged, how many um, miles you've recorded, um, how much CO2 you're saving, um, but then perhaps have different tools to um, engage you, such as being able to set goals um, and be able to see like different badges um, that you might want to achieve along the way. So you might decide that you want to um, cycle to work uh, five days a week or uh, five days in a month. So we've got a goal, we've got a badge that sort of aligns with any goals that you might want to set yourself. Um, I think we've also got, um, uh, you're able to graph your data as well. So you'll be able to see how much riding uh, you uh, did when you first joined us, um, when, when you might have been a new rider to then a year later, compare your September uh, 2019 to your September 2020. And then that's a really visible way of you seeing how much you've um, increased and hopefully being motivated by your own behavior. Yeah, I think it's really useful from, um, for like our clients as well, because it means that we're really working closely to get as many new riders as possible on the platform. So you're getting a spread of data, not just from really keen cyclists who are already performing that behavior, but we work really hard to make sure that we're getting new riders on the platform and we're finding out about them and then helping them move on their journey from new rider up to one day being a regular rider. Exactly. And we, so we segment our audience quite a lot as well, not only through our communications, but through the leaderboards that are available on the site. So um, some people may not be sort of motivated by competition. Um, they feel like they can't compete with uh, people who are clocking up hundreds of miles, who are a regular rider, but they might be able to compete with somebody who's a new rider just like them. Um, so there's that. Um, sort of tool that we agree offer on our leaderboards and with the understanding that new riders are slightly different. Yeah. And I um, just had a follow up from Emily saying, in terms of safety, I meant more in terms of being alone in the dark rather than cycling safety aspects. So I suppose there's a few things you can do there. It's um, you could like carpool your cycling. So if you have people who are starting and finishing at similar times, living on the same route, even if it means taking a, a little bit extra, you could cycle together and drop off along the way. Um, and then there's also routing. Like I tend to route my rides so that they're on quieter roads during rush hour. But at nighttime, there's certain areas where I wouldn't cycle. So then I'll route myself onto busier roads because there will be less traffic. Um, but they will be well lit and there will still be, be people around on them. So I suppose it's a mix of kind of buddying up when you can, um, but then, um, yeah, routing. So I adjust my route depending on weather, time of day and who I'm with. Um, so having, I think it's always really good to uh, look to the keen beans in an organization. Um, your HR department or your wellbeing team might not have the best information or motivation to help share cycling um, so it's always good to try and find the keen cyclists in your business as well so that then you can make the most of their like really localized knowledge to share and get more people hyped with them really because they're normally the best ones there's a i've heard a really good example of, of finding out who those keen beans are and um of whether they they live near you so People may not often know that they share the same route with somebody who they sit, you know, a few desks down from. Um, but there's an exercise where you can get people in a room, get them to stand on certain uh, certain corners of the room, and then that represents certain parts of like the town or the city that they live in. And so they're able to talk to um, their colleagues about, you know, how do you get to work? Which route do you go on to? And then that might help with some of that that route planning. Um, finding out where people live, who, work, who, who your colleagues are. And um, yeah, it's, it's a good tool to, to get in from A to B. Absolutely. Um, and I think that is us. Um, so all that's left to say is um, definitely go and visit our colleague, Sam. He's in the booth all day. Um, he can answer any questions that we may have missed in the chat. I think we've answered them all. 
Um, if we haven't, apologies, but definitely go and speak to Sam. Um, if you want to watch the Supporting More Women to Rive uh, webinar, which has some really detailed information, but also we were joined by Sustrans and Cycling Scotland, which is fantastic, head to blog.lovetoride.net. Um, and yeah, just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us and for joining in the discussion. And hopefully you've all left with a completed task that's going to help you engage some new people in your area too. Cool. Thank you for